This year in the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, we are initiating a new process, which we all think will be very important to our members and very instructive. And that is we are embarking upon um, a history gathering mission to identify those pioneers and major contributors to our society and to the field who fortunately are still alive and can be interviewed. So today we're interviewing Dr. Stuart Jameson, who played a fundamental role in the development of this society and in other areas of advanced heart and lung disease. Stuart, you were born in Zimbabwe, isn't that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, when I was born, actually, it was called Southern Rhodesia. And then um, later on, it became affiliated with Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland to be the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. And then Nyasaland later became Malawi, and Northern Rhodesia became Zambia. And Southern Rhodesia was all alone, and since there was no, now no Northern Rhodesia, it became Rhodesia. And then later on, it became Zimbabwe, but technically I was born in Southern Rhodesia. So you eventually left Zimbabwe and went to London. <clears throat> that must have been a difficult time for you, particularly since you were in a level of rather high education. Tell us about that. Well, it was, it was a tough time. Civil War was just beginning. Um, Ian Smith had declared a unilateral declaration of independence from Britain about a year before. Britain responded by putting sanctions on Rhodesia, and you couldn't get food supplies and gasoline, and it, it was a tough time. And. Um, Unfortunately, that year, when I was probably 17, my father died, which made things more difficult. But it had always been my intention to go and study in England. And um, I'd been admitted to the University of London for medical school. So um, at the end of 1966, I showed up in London. And it was actually a very tough time because I was sort of persona non grata in England, being from a rebel colony. And um, they, the sanctions included bank accounts and every, everything was frozen. And my father had died, so um, I was pretty penniless, but I w was determined to do medicine. And. Um, basically worked my way through medical school at that time. And how did you become interested in heart surgery and in particular heart transplantation? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, ever my, since my earliest memory, I wanted to be a doctor. And I always wanted to be a surgeon. When I was a child, I used to operate on little grapes and take the pits out and then sew the grapes up again. And I think once I went into medical school, the, it seemed to me that the, the, the most cutting edge, exciting, challenging part of surgery was cardiac surgery. And of course, in the, you, you remember in the mid to late 1960s, it was nothing like it is now. But they were doing cardiac surgery at St. Mary's Hospital, where I trained, where Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, incidentally. And um, even in my pre-med years, I would go and assist in the operating room, and I just became captivated with it. And then um, St. Mary's Hospital was uh, one of the founding institutions of immunology, with uh, Alexander Fleming and Sir Almuth Wright, and um, some of the very first Kidney transplants, if not the first kidney transplants in Europe, were done at this at my hospital. So uh, obviously, I gravitated into that, and um, I had a patron who was Ken Porter, who was head of pathology 
who took me under his wing and I was doing research in his lab. And uh, Ken was the pathologist for Tom Stasel. And Tom would send all his kidney biopsies and so on, and then when he started doing livers, over to um, Ken to be analyzed. And actually, Stasel, during the period of time when I was a medical student with Ken Porter, uh, came over for a year's sabbatical. And we worked together for a little while. So I had gravitated towards transplantation. And then, of course, when heart transplantation came in, late 1967, that was then a no-brainer that from then on I would be interested in heart transplantation. So tell us a little bit about what you remember of the days leading up to that uh, historic event and sort of the general global atmosphere. Well, I think transplantation was still felt as a, as a sort of highly experimental endeavor. The idea of heart transplantation seemed impossible. You know, almost a magical event, and certainly in those days, there were these immense emotional overlays with with anything to do with heart transplantation. Um, still, I mean, in the public perception, the existence of life was synonymous with a heartbeat, and there was also the emotional overlay of, you know, thinking with your heart and and so on. It seems strange now to talk about that, but that's the way it, it was. And I suppose I was a um, second or third year medical student when I, I came into the residence where I was living, medical student's residence, and I saw on the news that Barnard had done a first heart transplant. and. Um, I had very mixed emotions about it. My heart sank because it may seem presumptuous, but I really wanted to be the first to do that. Mm, you were that. Uh, um, I, I was that advanced. aggressive, maybe, and that you know, I had my eyes set on a, a set on a career in heart transplantation mm. when I was a young medical student. Yeah. So really, even sure. before transplantation existed, heart yes. transplantation existed. Yes, because it seemed natural. Mm. You know, we were doing kidneys. Stasel had started livers. It just seemed a, a natural evolution that one day that would happen. I think it happened earlier than I thought. Mm. What did you know of Norman Shumway at that time when you were toiling away in London? What was uh, the impact of Shumway? Well, I think everybody knew about Shumway. Uh, certainly not in 1967. I didn't. But... Um, by the late 1960s, I would say that in the field he was pretty much a household name. Mm -hmm. And that really leads on to, um, sort of reconnects with my story because by early 1970 I was, I had graduated as a physician and um, I had to do the year's internship. They call it being a houseman and a house surgeon over there. And then I think in the um, oh, when I was a when I was a medical student, I used to go and uh, help Magdi Yakub in his private clinic doing heart surgery. And of course, he was a tremendously impressive man. And I was simply nothing at that time, you know, peasant off the street. But he was very kind to me, he let me help him. And uh, I got to say that was absolutely inspirational. And uh, it was very gratifying to me that subsequently we became friends. But um, he was then, just as he is now, the you know, consummate surgeon and absolute gentleman. Um, but so by early 1970, I had become a doctor and I interrupted my general surgery in 1973 to go spend a year at the Brompton Hospital. And the Brompton Hospital, together with the National Heart Hospital and Harefield, 
Actually, Hatfield hadn't really taken off then because Magdy had not, I don't think, been appointed there and the Hammersmith, so that the three main heart hospitals in London were the Brompton, the National Heart, and uh, Hammersmith. And I went to the Brompton, and the senior surgeon there was Matt Panath, who's retired now, of course. But Matt had been at the University of Minnesota with Walt Lilly High in the early days, in the 50s, mid-50s, when um, Minnesota, as you know, was responsible for the development of open heart surgery between first at the University of Minnesota and then at the Mayo Clinic with um, Dr. Magoon and Dr. Kirkland. Well, um, so Matt was a resident at the University of Minnesota with many people, including Christian Cabral and um, Shamway and uh, Barnard. They were all residents there together. And um, well, I spent a, a, a year then, uh, I would say 1973 at the Brompton, and that simply reinforced my determination to go into that field. And I went back there as a registrar in 1977. You discussed your experiences in the early 1970s, yet during that five-year period, the results were horrible in heart transplantation. How did you persist with your interest in cardiac transplantation when most of the patients were dying? Well, it, I, I knew it was possible. I knew it had to be possible. But as you remember, in 1968, the world was captivated by this incredible phenomenon that you could take somebody who was moribund and dying, I mean, literally gasping their last breath, in a much worse state than we would transplant people now. I mean, it's swollen all over, absolutely short of breath, uh, unable to walk or get out of bed, and within a few days after transplantation, convert them into somebody that was walking around, uh, conversing normally, off oxygen, uh, with all the fluid rapidly going from their body. Uh, so, yeah, if this thing would work, it would be magical. And so you went to Stanford. Why pick Stanford? Was it the only place where they really had an educational program in transplantation? Had all the other programs basically died? There really wasn't anybody. You know, in 1968, there were 101 heart transplants done by um, over 60 teams in 22 countries. I mean, everybody was doing it. But within another two or three years, nobody was doing it. Mm -hmm because it simply didn't work. And the only person still doing it was um, Chumway. I say the only person. I, Chumway and uh, Lauer, who had trained with Chumway, had by then gone to Richmond, Virginia, and had a program. So I think the two successful programs in the world were Chumway's group and uh, Dick Lauer's group. And so I was uh, very interested, obviously, in going to Shamway. And uh, Shamway really didn't take people from outside. Uh, but he'd taken one other, and that was Philip Caves, who, when he was at Stanford, was a great hit with Shamway. And Shamway liked him very much. And as you know, he developed the technique of the endomyocardial biopsy with what was then called, I don't know if it still is, the cave's biotome. And uh, Philip had come back to London and took the position of chair, I believe, at the University of Glasgow. And as a young man in his 30s, he died of a myocardial infarct in a squash court. Well, so uh, Panath, my chief, had been a resident together with Shamway, and Panath 
asked Shamui to take me. And, and, and he did. And um, I got a uh, British Heart Foundation, American Heart Association scholarship, $12,000 a year, which uh, sent me to England and paid all my expenses. I lived frugally, rode a bicycle. And so I spent a year with Shumway in 1978. And um, I uh, had never been to America before, and I arrived at the airport in San Francisco. And it was very different from uh, England. I suddenly sort of felt at home because it was like South Africa and Rhodesia, the trees that grew there and the flowers and the, and the climate. And um, so I arrived on a long flight. I checked into a local motel and um, changed my clothes and I set off to go find Dr. Shumway. And uh, I walked across the campus to Stanford to the medical school and asked where his office was. And I got shown up there and his office was probably six foot by eight foot. And it had in it a desk and a chair. There wasn't room for two chairs. And I couldn't believe that this household name, this, this person who was arguably one of the most successful surgeons in the world, had this tiny office. And he was there in his scrubs and white coat. And he insisted I sit down. And there was only one chair. And I wasn't going to sit in a great man's chair. But he sat on the desk. And I sat in his chair, and that was my first interview with him. He was just a very humble, decent man. And he said, what do you want to do while you're here? So I said, I want to do clinical work. So he sent me onto the wards for the first six months. And then the second six months, uh, I went to the lab. And um, I had a grant from a drug company. And with that grant, we were doing heart transplants in monkeys. And up until that time, the Shumway lab had only done transplants in dogs. But uh, using primates was a much more useful model. And around October 78, we heard about a new drug called cyclosporin that uh, had, had been used experimentally in kidney transplants by Roy Kahn at Cambridge. And uh, we managed to get hold of this and, and, and put it in the heterotopic transplants in rats, first of all, and then in the orthotopic transplants in monkeys. And it became very clear that this was much better immunosuppressant than anything that we had seen. I mean, it transformed the post-operative management and uh, I was due to go back to London by the end of 1978. And one day I bumped into Shumway in the corridor and he said, um, Stuart, what are you doing next year? So I said, well, I'm going back to London. He said, well, why don't you stay another year? So I said, well, thank you very much, sir. I'd love to. So I did. I stayed another year. And that was a transformative year for me because I spent another six months in the lab, and we worked out uh, a lot to do with the psychosporin, and figured out that psychosporin was better than anything that we'd used up until that time. And then at the end of my lab year, I became Shumway's chief resident. And um, being Shumway's chief resident meant you not only were his chief resident on the regular service, but you also were in charge of the heart transplants. And we were doing maybe, we did probably in that net in my year, probably 25 heart transplants, which was more than half of the transplants done in the rest of the world. But it was arduous. I mean, this was a 24 hour job. You never left the hospital. And uh, every few days, we would do endomyocardial biopsies, and it was my job to do them. 
and um, the patients were in the hospital for maybe two, three months at a time. But uh, the survival rate was uh, impressive. It was over 70 percent one year, and it was based on azathioprine, steroids, and antithymocyte globulin. Uh, but then work went on in the lab simultaneously um, with the primates, and um, Bruce had just l left his chief residency, and he became in charge of the lab. So Shamway went to Bruce Wrights and said, why don't you take another look at heart and lung transplantation? Now, why was he thinking about heart and lung at that particular time? Well, he had done some of the early heart and lung transplants in dogs. You remember, probably, again, in the mid to late 60s, mm -hmm. Uh, experimentally, and the thing about cyclosporin was it allowed almost normal healing, and that was dramatic. It didn't have the, 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 the effects on healing that the steroids and the imuran and the, and, the, and the ATG had, and all the previous uh, experiments, uh, human um, trials in lung transplantation had failed almost uniformly because of bronchial dehiscence. Chamway felt two things. Number one, you shouldn't do single lung transplantation, that you should just transplant the engine block, the heart and both lungs, because it would be easier. Actually, it was more difficult, but conceptually easier. And that the bronchial, the tracheal supply, because of the coronary tracheal collaterals, would be sounder. And so um, we were doing the first heart and lung transplants in primates. Uh, Bruce was in charge, um, I suppose, in 1979. And um, at the end of 79, Shumway bumped into me again and he said, what are you doing next year? And I said, well, so I'm going back to London, and he said, why don't you just stay? And, uh, you know, Shumway was the sort of person you never really had any further discussion. You didn't need to. I didn't say, what will I be? What will I do? How much will I be paid? You know, I just said, thank you. I'd like, like to do that. No contracts, nothing with writing. Zero, nothing. We, didn't, we never discussed money. We never discussed office. We never discussed what I'd be doing. You know, he was such a great guy that you just knew that he'd treat you fairly and it would work. Tell us a little bit more about the people who were involved and some of their interactions with you and their contributions. There was Ed Stinson. He was Shumway's number two, his lieutenant. And Ed pretty much did everything. And Ed was a very smart and extremely technically gifted surgeon. But he'd never done general surgery. Shumway had taken him pretty much from a medical student and plugged him right into heart surgery. So at a young age, he was experienced, as most people are, halfway through their careers. And there was Phil Oyer, who was also a very smart person, very interested in computers at a very early time. Craig Miller was a year ahead of me, and he was never interested in the transplants, but uh, was primarily interested in vascular surgery. And uh, there was Bruce Wright. So that was the team. And each, uh, they were all very different. But Chumway had this uncanny skill of putting a team together that was unbeatable. And the other thing about him was he was sort of like a big umbrella. He protected you from all the slings and arrows that came through the department, which were many, because as you know, people were tremendously jealous, are tremendously jealous of anybody who's prominent and successful. But, and and Shumway protected everybody from that, and his young guys just went to work. And everybody developed their own interests, 
Ed was very interested in conventional heart surgery and the heart transplants. Uh, Bruce was interested in the heart lungs. Craig was doing vascular. Oyer and Ed were sort of a team and they would work one month on and one, one month off. And um, so the, in 1980, in December 1980, we did the first patient with cyclosporin. That was the first human heart transplant to be treated with cyclosporin. And I was junior faculty then. And um, we, we had a young man who was in the intensive care unit who was dying of end-stage heart failure. He had a myopathy. He was on the intraaortic balloon pump. There was really no ventricular assist or anything at that time. And um, we got a donor, the only donor that was available from a, um, I think it was about a 12-year-old. So I went off to get the donor and Phil Oyer took this patient to the operating room. And I came back with the donor heart that was, oh, about this big, maybe a tiny bit bigger. And Phil and I looked at this thing and we, we just couldn't help laughing because there was just no way that that was going to support the circulation. On the other hand, this young man was dying. And so, we did a heterotopic transplant, and that was the only heterotopic transplant that I've ever done. I think the only heterotopic transplant ever done at Stanford. And it was done because the, the, the heart was simply too small to carry the load. And um, that was also the first patient treated with, in the world with cyclosporin. And uh, it was miraculous. Over the weeks, this little heart grew and then pretty soon took over the circulation. And we could tell that because on echo, you could tell that the native aortic valve stopped opening. And uh, I believe that patient's still alive today. Mm. Heart lung transplantation was really a major part of your contribution. So tell us the story of heart lung transplantation at Stanford and your experiences after that time. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think 1982 or 1983, Cyclosporin became available for general use. And really, that was the can opener for the picnic. It just, everybody, it just took off. Hmm. So, and uh, simultaneously to all this, in 1980 and early 81, um, in the lab with Bruce Wrights and Nelson Burton, and um, Dr. Panic, uh, we were doing heart lung transplants, orthotopic heart lung transplants in, in uh, monkeys. And most of those were done by hypothermia, interestingly enough. We didn't use the heart lung machine, just total body hypothermia and then arrested and then sewed in the heart and lungs. And um, there were early long-term survivors, and it was clear that in primates, this was an endeavor that was going to work. And it seems natural now, you know, that we, I mean, heart and lung transplantation works, but in dogs, heart and lung transplantation never worked because they seem to be very dependent on the herring brewer reflex to breathe in and out. And the dogs would develop this gasping type of respiration and they would die of respiratory failure after a few days. Um, primates seemed to work fine, probably because they had other types of receptors, either due to blood gases or to chest wall receptors that seemed to regulate breathing. But we learned that in the, in the in 1980 from those early heart and lung transplants. And then the first transplant was done uh, by uh, Shumway and uh, Wrights in March 1981. And um, John Warwick was chief resident. And Bruce called me around five one evening and said um, that um, 
the first patient was going to be down. So um, we showed up in the operating room and it took place that evening. And uh, there was unbelievable press coverage and there were even security guards around the operating room and in the ICU. And uh, it was very interesting that people were so um, captivated by this, almost like the first <coughs> heart transplant. And um, so in 1981, I think there were um, probably five heart-lung transplants that were done. And in 90, early, around the end of 1981, Bruce had decided to go to Johns Hopkins. And he made the transition in around May of 1982, uh, at which point um, Chamway made me director of heart and lung transplantation. So, you know, I was, I was um, very gratified by that. Obviously, I'd only been on staff for a couple of years. And um, here I was at age 34 or 35, the only person in the world doing heart-lung transplants. Um, if my recollection is correct, um, Denton Cooley had tried one, um, Bernard uh, Christian had tried one, maybe Cabral. I think uh, the first one was done by Walt Lillyhigh. Uh, Lillyhigh, yeah. Those, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lillyhigh, Christian Barnard, and Cooley. And, uh, Help us understand a little bit the reasons, other than just cyclosporin, why they may have failed and the Stanford team succeeded. Well, you know, the key uh, to Shumway's program was always a, a careful, methodical approach that was thoroughly grounded in, in careful lab laboratory work. And so that's not to say we didn't progress rapidly. We often did. I mean, if we had a problem in the clinic, we'd go to the lab, and maybe within three or four weeks, we would have a new drug or a new technique that would immediately go into the patients. Probably couldn't do that now, but um, it, nothing ever happened in the operating room that hadn't been carefully worked out in the animals. And uh, I doubt very much that any of the other people that you just mentioned had, had done it in the lab. And um, so that certainly would have been one factor. Another factor probably was that um, the cases they chose were probably uh, not optimal candidates. I don't know much about uh, Lily High's case, but I know that Barnard's case was a young child with an AV canal with severe pulmonary hypertension uh, that, that died within oh, a day, probably, I think. Um, that's not to be critical of any of those people. You know, um, they were taking patients in whom death was within a very short period of time was a certainty. And they certainly were doing their best under the circumstances. So um, I would never be critical of them having done that. But the, the, the atmosphere at Stanford was, was just very different, that you, 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 you had to produce sound laboratory work before you could go into the clinic. You've described the development and the first cases of heart and lung transplantation, and you lived through the first era of heart transplantation. Yet during that very exciting time, there was an intersection between those clinical developments and the need for the development of a society, the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. You were one of the pioneers in this development. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, um Ed Stinson and Phil Oyer, um, in, in 1980, if we just take that year, were probably the two leaders in heart transplantation. Shumway was the spiritual head. But I went to Stanford in 1978, and I left in 86. 
and I never saw him do a heart transplant. I mean, he didn't. He took the heat and he provided the guidance. And if you were in trouble in the operating room, he would generally come in and scrub. Not so much to help, but for moral support. And should there be an adverse outcome, he was conveying to you that it was going to be his fault, not yours. So, I mean, he was an absolutely brilliant mentor. So, Ed Stinson and Phil Oya were really the two people who were the head of the program at that time. And in 1980, I think because of Michael Hess, who was a cardiologist at Richmond, Virginia, which was the other program doing heart transplants, there was the suggestion of a heart transplant society. I was sent as the envoy from the Stanford group, not because at all because of my importance, but because nobody else could be much bothered to show up. And um, there had been a preliminary sort of discussion with a handful of people, I think Jack Copeland and Michael Hess, um, in Miami, I think at the American Heart Meetings in, in, in around um, October um, of um, 1980. And it was arranged that there would, a group of people would get together at the University of Chicago in January 1981. And um, so, uh, early one morning, uh, with the sponsorship of Bob Replogel at uh, University of Chicago, this group got together and there were certainly no more than eight people there. And Jacques Lossman was there and Michael Hess and uh, Solomon from um, Jack Copeland's group and uh, myself, and um, there were a, a few talks about to bring people up to date about what everybody was doing. And then there was discussion as to whether there should be a society of heart transplantation. And in many ways, it seemed a bit foolish because nobody was doing heart transplants. And why have yet another society where you're only going to get a handful of people? But uh, speaking for myself, I felt it was very important because it was inevitable, really, with the type of success. And uh, this was, this was, uh, I guess, just a, a month or two after the first case of psychosporin, um, that um, there should be a society. Uh, my feeling was to try and get some uh, control of uh, statistics and results. Uh, and without a society, there'd be no mechanism for that. And from my point of view, the, the pivotal point of the society would be that we would keep a registry. And as the people, as the programs grew, um, they would want to belong to the society and they would want to participate in the registry. So that was sort of a preliminary meeting, the meeting in January 81 in Chicago. And then I think the first official meeting of the society was in March 81 in San Francisco. Held in San Francisco because of Stanford and there were maybe 40 people at that first meeting. Over half of them were from Stanford. So there was Sharon Hunt and the pathologist Margaret Billingham and the surgeons and uh, John Schroeder, one of the cardiologists. And um, Shumway went and um, it was sort of a fun day just discussing where we stood. And the meeting after that in 1982 was in Arizona. And for the first, oh, for the first seven years, the society was so small that we felt we couldn't, it would, wouldn't work to have a, a meeting independent 
of another meeting. And so we alternated, I think, between the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and we'd tag on at the beginning or the end, and the American Association of Thoracic Surgery, the beginning or the end. Because again, the society at that time, certainly for the first six or seven years, was driven entirely by the surgeons. So we attached it to a surgical meeting. What did Shumway think about the society? Did he approve? I don't think he disapproved. I think he didn't think much of it. And uh, he probably, he showed up to the first one because it was in San Francisco. But I think his attendance subsequently was pretty spotty. But, you know, he was like that in many ways. I, I, he just, he preferred to fly under the radar. And I think having the society was a bit too prominent for him. He was made right in the beginning the honorary, the honorary president. And I think that was a statement that everybody wanted to honor what he had done to, to bring transplantation to where it was. Because in the lay mind, the person responsible was Barnard, and of course that wasn't the case. Now, I believe you were the fourth president of the ISHLT. Well, the way it worked was that Michael Hess was the first. And after he had uh, done his year, and I think Jack Copeland was the second, there were so few of us that I proposed that everybody be president for two years, because otherwise we'd soon run out of presidents. <laughs> so Jack was president for years two and three. And then I think Terence English was president for years four and five. So I think I would have been president for years six and seven. So if you look at the transition of the society, and as well the field between 1980 and your two years as president. Did you have a sense of accomplishment that there had been a movement towards science or was it still quite experiential? Well, I think it was a progressive thing. The meeting slowly started to get bigger. When I was president, the, for the first year the meeting was in New York and by now we were in the hundreds instead of in the teens. And the next year, which would have been 1988, uh, was the meeting was in Anaheim, again attached either to AATS or the STS. And it was a much bigger meeting, but it still was well, two or three, four hundred people. But the, 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 the concept of being the society, being the body that maintained the registry was adhered to. And I think that was a very important concept because that was the beginning of some sort of scientific analysis of results because people were using different treatment regimens. And clearly, if you didn't analyze outcomes, you would, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of analyzing uh, where you, what your treatment was was a non starter. The other thing that I pushed very hard for was to make the society the Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. Because for the first few years, it was the Society for Heart Transplantation. And Joel Cooper had started doing single lung transplantation. And Joel, who is a very good friend, who I admire a lot, started maintaining a registry of lung transplants. And I felt that a registry of lung transplantation outside of the heart transplant registry was, was not appropriate. And so we changed the name of the journal and the society to heart and lung transplantation. I can't remember exactly when that happened, but probably the mid-80s. Mid mm -hmm. And Joel maintained a separate registry running alongside us for a while, and then eventually that died and, it, as you know, became part of the heart and lung transplant registry. And uh, the journal grew. The journal, it, it, for the first few years, we were just begging for papers. I mean, anybody who had anything to say did so through the vehicle of the journal. And you well know now that it's a very competitive journal with 
very good peer review articles, but it wasn't like that in the beginning. Are there any aspects of the international component of the society that you feel have been a major advantage or disadvantage to this experience of heart and lung transplantation? I do think it needs to be international. I, I, I feel that very strongly because I think that really the United States has led the way and still does, well, probably well over half the world's transplants. and. Um, the U European group, of course, became much stronger later. But elsewhere, um, I think the leadership of the society has encouraged and helped in many ways. I mean, both as, as a leadership, in a leadership way, but also in a scientific way, has encouraged the growth of transplantation in many other countries. Um, now, where it goes in the future, um, clearly we're always going to be limited in terms of, uh, of donors, and that's always been the Achilles heel of heart transplantation. So the way out of that, of course, is with xenograft transplantation. But, uh, you know, that's a formidable obstacle. I spent many, many years in the lab working with xenograft transplants and I really have the greatest respect for... Um, xenografts. And uh, Shumway, in his famous way, said, xenografts are in the future and always will be. And that's a very tough nut to crack. Now, I would never say anything's impossible, uh, but a very tough nut to crack. So. As the years passed, you developed another interest in a very related area of advanced heart and lung failure. That is patients dying of pulmonary hypertension secondary to chronic thromboembolic disease. You have developed an immense practice and experience and really now are the most experienced surgeon in the world performing the procedure of a pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. This is an amazing contribution which is juxtaposed to your already major contributions in the field of transplantation. Tell us a little bit how you developed your interest and expertise and contributions in that area. Well, I have always felt it's very important to learn as much as we can from the vehicle of heart transplantation. And heart transplantation has been expensive and, and it has been a difficult endeavor. And as well you know, it's been criticized roundly by many for its expense and, 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 and for the toll that it's taken along the way. But I've always looked upon it rather like uh, the effort to go to the moon, that um, probably very little was gained by going to the moon, I mean in a direct sense. There's nobody there now. There won't be anybody there for a long time. What was the point? The point was that it was part of scientific advancement. And the spin-off in technology from doing that continues and will for a long time. And the same with heart transplantation. It showed us what was possible. It, it led us into a realm of treatment that of, of, of people that heretofore had been impossible to treat. And we've learned a huge amount from it. Uh, so I've been very keen on uh, looking also at satellite programs that can be used to treat some of the, this huge volume of patients that initially were referred to as just for heart or heart and lung transplantation. And I think the artificial heart will continue to grow. And now with, um, with destination therapy, I think has immense, immense promise. Well, in 19, um, it must have been in late 1982 or early 1983, I uh, tried to do a heart-lung transplant on a young man who'd been uh, referred to us from the Mayo Clinic with uh, chronic thromboembolic disease. And uh, he was um, very incapacitated, could hardly move, could hardly breathe. 
and it seemed very reasonable to do a heart lung transplant on him. And he died perioperatively because he had such immense adhesions in the chest that we never got on top of the bleeding post-op. And I learned a very solid lesson from that, and I just couldn't help thinking that there, since this was a mechanical problem, a mechanical obstruction, that uh, there'd have to be a, an, another way of treating that. So in any event, I went to Minnesota, and then in 1986, I uh, went to UCSD, where I've now been for uh, 1989, I went there. So I've now been there for 20 years. Ken Moshe was there, and Ken Moshe was a very prominent pulmonary physician who um, had been instrumental in persuading, firstly, Charles Huffnagel at Georgetown, and secondly, um, Nina Brownwald at UCSD to operate on people with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And because of Moser, um, UCSD, the University of California, San Diego, had become that sort of hub for the treatment of chronic thromboembolic disease. And uh, after Nina Brownwald had been Joe Utley, and then uh, Pat Daly and Walt Dembitsky. And when I came to UCSD in 1989, I think a total of 140 odd of these PTEs had been done over a span of 20 years. So in essence, a handful. But uh, I began to realize how many patients there were in the country with this disease. And um, I felt that uh, this was a very, uh, very dramatic treatment. It's like taking out a cork and the patient gets back to normal. And really the transplantation was completely inappropriate for these patients. And so we built up the volume. We've now done nearly two and a half thousand of these operations. We do about 150 a year now. And uh, the mortality rate in the last two years has been under 2%. So a very safe operation. Um, it can be done um, at your leisure. You're not doing it at 2 in the morning with a like a transplant. So it can be done in a carefully planned way. And the patients are essentially cured. They have to stay on Coumadin for the rest of their lives, but there's no immunosuppression and uh, no rejection and no other sequelae. So there's no question that uh, this is one of those areas in whom we used to do heart and lung transplants, and maybe some people in the world are still doing heart and lung transplants for this condition. I hope not, but have been um, uh, can be very readily treated now with the pulmonary endarterectomy. You know, Stuart, in many ways, you're a very fortunate man. You've had uh, the opportunities and the timing to make major contributions, not only in the field of transplantation, not only in the field of thromboembolic disease, but also in the formation of a society which we feel is one of the most important scientific societies in the world, ISHLT. When you're talking to young surgeons and those interested in this field, how do you help get them out of the doldrums of their everyday activities and inspire them to do what you did, to find an opportunity, take advantage of it, provide the work ethic, and actually contribute? What's your secret? Well, you know, uh, um Somebody once said, everything in life is luck and timing. And I think I've been really lucky to have first great mentors. I mean, man, Matt Panath took me under his wing while well, starting with Porter and then Panath and then Shumway. Um, these people were like fathers to me. And um, there's no question that I was very fortunate to be accepted into their programs at the right time.
and given the opportunity to participate in being part of a difference. But apart from luck and timing, you know, there's just no free lunch. And I think if I retired 10 years ago, I would have put in more hours than any of the trainees that I see come through now if they live to 70. And I think all of us, our generation, didn't have the expectations that many people do now of things being there, available and handed to you. Um, I, I really believe that it doesn't matter in what field you are, that um, you may be lucky, uh, you may be gifted, uh, but um, without that uh, ingredient of hard work and dedication, putting in the hours, that part of it doesn't make any difference. And um, you and I have been very lucky to have a career that, where we love what we do, and so that the work doesn't seem like work. And um, it's just fun. And uh, I've been so lucky to work with people who saw it as fun. And um, it was um, just a privilege working with them and was a wonderful experience. And I think that uh, there, there are still people like that out there, maybe less of them. But, you know, we've just gone through our residency interviews and uh, for next year. And uh, these, this crop of young people coming through are as good a caliber, smart, wonderful pedigrees as any that I've ever seen in 30 years. And I don't think that the volume of applicants, certainly to our program, is down either. And uh, I think there always will be exceptional people that will make a difference. Heart surgery, heart and lung surgery, is still one of the most challenging and therefore one of the most exciting specialties. It's still very cutting edge. After I did my first heart, heart transplant, which was on July 4th, 1978, I thought, I've climbed the mountain. That's the pinnacle there. Everything from here on is down. What, what, what is going to be next? But there always is something, isn't there? Then there was heart and lung transplantation. Then there was single lung transplantation. Then double lung transplantation. Then living related transplantation in the field of heart surgery. There's the whole field of pediatrics, which is immensely innovative and becoming more so. In adult cardiac surgery, there's minimally invasive and potentially robotic surgery. And now stem cell therapy and uh, left ventricular assist devices. Um, there's always something new on the horizon. And uh, so I am not at all one of those people that think that heart surgery has seen its best days. I just wish I was starting all over again because I think the next 30 or 40 years will be more exciting than the last. Stuart, thank you very much. You're welcome.